On the evening of September the 11th, 2001, the FBI were called in to Logan Airport in Boston to examine two check-in bags. The bags had missed their flight, an American Airlines Boeing 767 bound for Los Angeles. The owner of the luggage was Mohammed Atta, a ringleader in that day's terrible event. Inside one of his bags, the FBI made an extraordinary discovery. Along with flight training videos and a small copy of the Quran, they found a five-page document, handwritten in Arabic. It was a kind of hijacker's manual and contained a justification for the attack written by those who orchestrated it. Purify your soul from all unclean things. Completely forget something called this world. Afterwards begins the happy life. Among the hijackers' victims on that bright, warm September morning were the passengers and crew of American Airlines Flight 11 the first of the four planes to crash that day. This film is the most detailed reconstruction yet of the last hour of Flight 11, from 7.46 a.m. when Atta boarded the plane to 8.46 when the Boeing 767 struck the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York. A startling new picture emerges of precisely how the crew relayed valuable information about their attackers to the outside world. It was the first act in a long war. With just a few passengers still to board, Flight 11 is 13 minutes away from takeoff. Betty Ong is one of the most experienced of the cabin crew. She wasn't scheduled to work today, but she's flying so that she can join her sister on a vacation in Hawaii. Right down this way, please. Hi. How are you this morning? Pretty good. Morning. Amy Sweeney has two yes. young children and is married to Michael, a Massachusetts police officer. Amy, she liked flying because it gave her the opportunity to, to do what she liked and, and be flexible with her time to spend with her family. Once we had kids, uh, we made the decision that she would only work part-time and spend the majority of time with, uh, with the kids and, and family. Hydraulics. Set. Windows. Doors. First Officer Tom McGuinness is 42 years old and married with two children. He's a former Air Force pilot. Cabin signs. On. Captain John Oganowski is 52 and married with three daughters. For a start checklist complete. He loved flying. He absolutely loved it. He was a very experienced pilot. He had 23 years with American Airlines and seven years in the Air Force. And um, he was just a man who was very, very um, skilled in, in anything with mechanics. He just had a knack for it. This morning, 25-year-old Patricia Massari and her husband Lewis have just discovered that they may be expecting their first child. She commutes from their small apartment in Queens to her office at an insurance company based on the 98th floor of the World Trade Center. Lewis had wanted Patricia to take the day off, but she's determined to go into the office. Although I didn't really want her to go to work, I kind of wanted her to stay home so we can kind of like tell the news to everybody or you know confirm it totally you know to a doctor whatever we had to do this morning she particularly left early because she knew that she had um, things that she was behind it at work to keep her mind you know uh, calmer throughout the day that's what she wanted to do get to work a little earlier 
On her way to work, Patricia collects another pregnancy test, just to be sure. She plans to call Lewis from her office as soon as she gets the result. Boston Air Traffic Control Center manages some of the busiest air traffic control lanes in the world. But the job's a little easier when the weather and visibility are as good as they are today. Northwest 453, speed mark A0 or greater. In 12 minutes, Flight 11 will take off into the Boston controller's airspace. The last passengers are now boarding Flight 11. Karen Martin, the flight's purser, and Bobby Arestegui will share duties in the first class cabin. Among the passengers is Daniel Lewin, a brilliant and wealthy software designer. He grew up in America, but moved to Israel with his family when he was 14. By his early 20s, he'd become a captain in Israel's elite counter-terrorism force. Champagne orange juice, sir? Champagne. There you go. He is seated directly in front of one of the hijackers, Satam El Sakami. One of the last passengers to board is Mohammed Atta. When you ride the airplane and before you enter it, you make a prayer and supplications. As the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, an action for the sake of God is better than all of what is in this world. When you step inside the plane and sit in your seat, be busy with the constant remembrance of God. God said, O ye faithful, when you find the enemy, be steadfast and remember God constantly so that you may be successful. With the arrival of Atta and Abdulaziz Alamari, all five hijackers are now in position. In the front passenger row of the aircraft are the brothers Walid and Wail Al Sheri. Walid has a clear view of the cockpit door. This was a military mission that they were on. They had done their, their homework, they'd gathered enough intelligence, they had done enough test flights. Everything that they did was specifically tailored to accommodate their objectives. Seating arrangements are crucial. We had the Al Sherry brothers sitting at the very front row left to the primary aisle. You had Atta and Dulaziz Al Amari sitting to the right of the aisle at, uh, at a peak point. And then you had Al Sakami sitting again to the left of the aisle. Um, for the back. A fresh pond subway station in Queens, Patricia Massari catches the M train to downtown Manhattan. Her journey will take her through the suburban sprawl of Queens and then underground towards New York's financial hub around Wall Street. American 11, cleared to push and start, tail north. When the aircraft moves, even slightly, say the supplication of travel, because you are traveling to Almighty God, so be attentive on this journey. attention as we review the safety features of the 767 aircraft. To fasten seat belts, insert the metal clip into the buckle. It's likely that flight attendants have some kind of contact with one or more of the hijackers. But all five would have been trained to blend in, to play by the rules, 
and do nothing to arouse suspicion. Two overwing exit. Do not seem confused or show signs of nervous tension. Be happy, optimistic, calm, because you are heading for a deed that God loves and will accept. If the cabin pressure changes, an oxygen mask will appear from the panel above you. Pull the mask towards you and place the mask over your nose and mouth. Smile in the face of hardship, young man, for you are headed toward eternal paradise. Please take the time to review the safety features card located in your seat pocket. God is with his faithful servants. He will protect them and make their tasks easier and give them success and victory. Say this supplication. O oh Lord, block their vision from in front of them so that they may not see. While Flight 11 is waiting for clearance to take off, Mohammed Atta makes one last phone call. It's not known what he says in a call that lasts just under a minute. But it is known that he calls Marwan al Shahi the hijack leader on board United Airlines Flight 175, which is taxiing just a few hundred meters away. United 175 is also bound for Los Angeles, but will crash into the south tower of the World Trade Center. Atta and al Shahi became close friends during the planning of the attacks and may be saying goodbye to one another. But they may also be confirming that the assault on the Twin Towers is on. Apron, American 11, ready to taxi for runway 25. What could drive Atta and the other hijackers to plan and execute such a cold-blooded attack? And what could possibly justify it? The answer to both questions lies not in Islam, but in a set of ancient beliefs practiced by only a tiny sect of radical Muslims. You have a faction who call themselves Salafists. Now, within Salafism, only a minority say that the way to be implemented is by force, by violence. These are the jihadists. Jihadists see themselves as holy warriors, and they view any act of indiscriminate murder as justified, so long as God's name is invoked. All the passengers on the plane were devout Muslims. It did not matter at all. Muslims do not matter. What matters is their ideology, their conception of what is right. And right in this case is basically what is dictated to them. American 11 Heavy, wind 100 and 10 knots, clear for takeoff, runway 09. Roger, tower. American 11, clear for takeoff, runway 09. Then the aircraft takes off. This is the moment that both groups come together. So remember God as he said, O oh Lord, pour your patience upon us and make our feet steadfast and give us victory over the infidels. Pray for yourself and all your brothers that they may be victorious and hit their targets. Ask God to grant you martyrdom facing the enemy, not running away from it, and for him to grant you patience and the feeling that anything happens to you is for him.
Patricia Massari arrives at Fulton Street subway station in downtown Manhattan. It's a five minute walk from here to her office at the World Trade Center. She gets off at Fulton Street and then walks up on the street level and then walks to the building itself and then goes up to the 98th floor. She loved the company, she loved the people she was with. She makes friends with anybody, so it was just like, it, it was her life, you know. Um, she would always tell me the stories, and I find it interesting when she would get home from work, when she would tell me how her day was at work. Patricia grabs her regular breakfast, probably a bagel and black coffee. Flight 11 climbs to cruising altitude. Preparations for the attack begin. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain has now switched off the seatbelt signs. However, we do advise that when you are not moving The weapons around, smuggled on board by the terrorists include knives, possibly small domestic tools with retractable blades, known as box cutters. Following standard procedures, the flight attendants would close curtain dividers between the three classes of cabin possibly obscuring any line of sight between Atta and the Al-Sheris. With the attack just minutes away, Atta may be directing the hijackers to get ready, physically and psychologically, to pass beyond the point of no return. Bismillah Rahman. You must make your knife sharp and must not discomfort your animal during slaughter. Remember the words of Almighty God. You were looking to the battle before you engaged in it. And now you see it with your own two eyes. At least one of the terrorists may have other weapons, including something that looks like a bomb. A black box with yellow and red colored wires. Is the bomb real? Or is it a hoax designed to ward off a potential counterattack by the passengers and crew? Maintain Mach 80 or greater. Boston Center, good morning. American 11 with you, passing through 190 for 230. American 11 Heavy, Boston Center. Roger, climb and maintain flight level 280. Flight level 280, American 11. As flight 11 continues to climb, the pilots would still be wearing their seat harnesses in a noisy cockpit. I think people need to understand that sitting in the cockpit, you're sitting forward, you're strapped in, you're low, you're at a complete disadvantage to anyone coming up behind you, especially people coming up behind you, extremely determined to do you harm. American 11 Heavy, climb maintain flight level 290. Flight level 290, American 11. Confrontation. 
invitation begins, strike like champions who do not want to go back to this world. Shout Allahu Akbar because this strikes fear in the hearts of the non-believers. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! God said strike above their neck, strike at all their extremities. FedEx 3258, contact Boston Center 125.57. 125.57, thank you. Good day. American 11, turn 20 degrees right. 20 right, American 11. What the hell is going on? The pilots are either killed instantly or removed from effective control of the plane. At some point during the assault, flight attendant Amy Sweeney reports being shown the apparent bomb by one of the hijackers. A mace or mustard gas is sprayed into the forward passenger cabins. Shortly afterwards, though, all five hijackers barricade themselves inside the cockpit. No one else on the plane will see or hear from them again. <laughs> Passengers in first and business class are evacuated back to economy by the flight attendant. American 11 Heavy, now climb maintain flight level 350. American 11, climb maintain flight 350. American 11, Boston. Losing radio contact with an aircraft is a rare event and is usually the result of equipment failures. But it's a cause for concern. Echo Romeo 7, Mike Lima, how do you hear? Mike Lima has you loud and clear. American 11, Boston. Flight 11 now starts to drift, silently, off course. On flight 11, Karen Martin and Bobby Arestegui are being treated for their injuries in or near the first class galley. They are likely to have been the first victims of 9-11. I think that the flight attendants that were attacked first, um, no questions about it. The hijackers decided to take action. They were going to implement speed, surprise and violence of action right away. They were going to make their point as to who they are and why they're there and so no one can mess with them. Unfortunately for the passengers and crew of Flight 11, Daniel Lewin had been stabbed by the hijacker seated directly behind him. Lewin was the best equipped of anyone on the plane to try and repel the assault. But the ex-Israeli commando is now severely injured with a wound to the throat. The passenger, Daniel Lewin, I think, was attacked for one of two reasons. Al Sukami was sitting right behind him, and it just could have been that uh, Daniel Lewin was right in reach and in range of any one of the terrorists that, uh, that were decided to use him as an example uh, for the other passengers, or Daniel Lewin decided to uh, take action and intervene. Soon after Boston, air traffic control loses radio contact with Flight 11. Its transponder is switched off.
Flight 11 is no longer transmitting information about its identity or altitude. All that remains is a radar signature showing the aircraft's location. American 1-1, uh, the American on the frequency. How do you hear me? The loss of transponder data is serious, but the controller would know from the radar that the plane still appears to be in flight. If everything goes well, every one of you should pat the other on the shoulder in confidence. Remind your brothers that this act is for Almighty God, or they should sing songs to boost their morale as the pious first generations did in the throes of battle. With the autopilot now switched off, the aircraft is in the complete control of Atta and the other four hijackers. Patricia Massari arrives at the World Trade Center Plaza. When she reaches her office, high up in the North Tower, she plans to carry out the second pregnancy test. After that, she hopes she can catch up with a heavy workload. American 456, resume normal speed. American 11, if you hear Boston Center, ident please or acknowledge. American 11, American 1-1, one, one, Boston. The flight attendants now organize themselves into teams to deal with the emergency on board and to get as much information out to the ground as they possibly can. They gather details from paperwork and from each other about who exactly the attackers were. American 11, if you hear Boston Center, recontact Boston Center on 127.82. That's American 12782. After all that's happened, the flight attendants make repeated attempts to contact the cockpit. Excuse me, what the hell is going on here? But the mace in the forward cabin makes it difficult to breathe. And all intercom calls to the cockpit go unanswered. Betty Ong attempts her first call to the ground. She dials American Airlines' main reservations number. Initially, she'll be plagued by what seems to be a poor connection and a series of misunderstandings. I'm number three in the back. Um, the cockpit's not answering. Captain, this is class. And um, I think there's mates that we can't breathe. I, I don't know. I think we're getting high breath. The assault was over so quickly that no one is absolutely sure what has happened inside the cockpit. Yeah. What, what, what seat are you in? Ma'am, what seat are you in? We're some, well, we just left Boston. Boston. We're up in the air. We're supposed to go to L.A. and the cockpit's not answering their phone. Okay, but what seat are you sitting in? What's the number of your seat? Okay, I'm in my jump seat right now. Okay. That's 3R. Okay, you're the flight attendant? I'm sorry, did you say you're the flight attendant? Hello? Yes, hello? What is your name? Hi. You're going to have to speak up. I can't hear you. Sure. What is your name? Okay, my name is Betty Ong. I'm number three on flight 11. Okay. And the cockpit is not answering their phone. And there's somebody staff in business class, and there's, we can't breathe in business class. Somebody's got mates or something. Can you describe the person that you said someone is what in business class? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm in, sitting the back. in the back. Somebody's coming back from business. If you can hold on a second. Throughout her calls to the ground, Betty is interrupted by back. other attendants who seem to be acting as a relay team. 
sending constant updates from further forward. Amy Sweeney makes one more attempt to contact the cockpit. Ten minutes after storming the plane, the hijackers decide it's time to talk to the passengers. But the wrong switch is keyed, and their announcement is broadcast to the ground. American 11, Boston. United 175 Boston uh, Center, Roger. Is that American 11 trying to call? We have some planes. Initially, the controllers don't hear the phrase, we have some planes. And uh, who's trying to call me here? American 11, are you trying to call? They immediately ask for a playback of audio tape. Nobody moved. Everything will be okay. If you try to make any move, you'll danger yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. We've got to make some calls. I'm on it. Boston controllers notify their chain of command that they believe Flight 11 has been hijacked. There are no reports of anyone on the plane hearing the hijacker's transmission. Amy Sweeney heads towards one of the backseat air phones. These require credit cards, and it's possible that she borrows a card from a nearby passenger. There is no record of a charge to Amy's or Betty's credit card accounts. It's Amy Sweeney. So I was just in my office working. I had heard one of the ladies who was working in the office say very loudly, uh, what, what, a, a flight attendant has been stabbed? Hello, American Airlines Flight Services, Logan. It's Amy Sweeney. Listen and listen very carefully. I'm on flight 11. The airplane has been hijacked. I have seat numbers. At that point, I took the phone and said, Amy, this is Michael Woodward. What's going on? Hey, Michael, this plane is being hijacked. After she told me that the aircraft had been hijacked, she started to give me information. I have seat numbers for three of the hijackers. She had given me the seat numbers that they were seated in. 9D, 9G, and 10B. And as I was writing down the seat numbers, my colleagues pulled up that information. In the computer system, they could pull up who's sitting in that seat. And up came Mohammed Atta's reservation. Good weather today. By now, United Airlines Flight 175 is airborne. The five hijackers on board have yet to make their move. Flight 11, Betty Ong reveals that despite the risks, cabin crew members have made at least one attempt to gain physical entry to the cockpit. I think the guys are up there. They might have gone their way up there or something. Nobody can call the cockpit. We can't even get inside. Betty and Amy Sweeney now work closely together to report the details of the hijack to the ground. Amy and Betty were trying to relay information. And so as I was talking to her, she would, you know, ask Betty, did you see this or, you know. Right. So they were kind of working in tandem to get the information out. I will find out it's now clear that while the hijackers are in control of the cockpit, <sighs> the flight attendants are in full control of the passenger cabins. I think the thing that you might have been most impressed with was their calmness that they were relaying information as quickly and as thoroughly as possible. I know as a crew member for American Airlines 
that they were following procedures to ensure a safe landing and um, the safety of all the passengers on board. It's just a, a medical emergency, ma'am. Um, Until September the 11th, 2001, so cabin crews were trained in the event of a hijacking to maintain calm among the passengers. So going to be just fine. The flight attendants use a cover story that this is all just a medical emergency. It's possible that the passengers evacuated from first and business who witnessed the attack go along with this in order to prevent the spread of panic. Amy Sweeney tells Michael Woodward that the cabin crew's efforts seem to be working. Wait, wait, wait. What she did say, though, was that everybody in the coach cabin was very calm. They had no idea, uh, the folks in coach, that the aircraft was being hijacked by these people. All right. In the background, um, there wasn't screaming. There wasn't, um, it was very calm. Calm meaning there wasn't a commotion. There wasn't noise. I mean, he was concerned. Until now, Flight 11 has been drifting on a northwesterly path, but the hijackers now execute a dangerously sharp 100 degree left turn. The plane is now heading south, erratically following the course of the Hudson River which leads straight to New York City. The transmission is picked up not just by air traffic controllers, but by United 175, which will be hijacked in six minutes. Having done a second pregnancy test, Patricia Massari calls her husband with the news that it's positive. She's excited, Hi. but also a little nervous. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did she always that. called when I was home on my day off to let me know that she was at work. So, you know, around 8.40, the first words out of her mouth was her usual self, which I kind of felt better about. She was questioning me, what are we going to do about this? Because she wanted to, to make sure that this is real, because she didn't believe it. It was just overwhelming, you know, to her and overwhelming to me. We're making another sharp turn all the way onto our side. Flight 11 has made another dangerous course change, possibly as a result of the hijackers' inexperience as pilots. Boston air traffic controllers radio United 175 to ask if they see Flight 11. You have traffic. Look at your uh, 12 to 1 o'clock at about uh, 10 miles southbound to see if you can see an American 767 out there. I see him. Affirmative, we have him. He's at uh, about 20, 29, 28,000. United 175, turn five, turn 30 degrees to the right. I want to keep you away from this traffic. Boston controllers now break official protocol and try to make direct calls to the military. All right, Boston Center, Team U. We have a, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York. And we need you guys to, we need someone to scramble some of 16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? No, this is not an exercise manifest. It will be another nine minutes before fighters are scrambled. On this cloudless morning, the Twin Towers will now be clearly in sight. Betty Ong and Amy Sweeney both report to the ground that the aircraft is being thrown around violently. The hijackers execute yet another terrifying maneuver, a steep and barely controlled dive. Oh, 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 oh,
she was now starting to get scared. For flight attendants to use those terms, rapid, it, it means it's quick, it's fast, something's going on. Um, you know, we're, they're used to, you know, tons of turbulence and, you know, bumpy flights and all of that, but um, she was really, really nervous at this point. Flight 11 has just passed into the airspace of New York traffic controllers. United 175 now reports the mysterious radio transmission it picked up earlier. New York, United 175 Heavy. United 175, go ahead. We figured we'd wait to go to your center. We heard a suspicious transmission on our departure out of Boston. Someone keyed the mic and said, everyone stay in your seats. Okay, I'll pass that along. It cut out. Kingston 93 line. United 175 just came on my frequency. And he said he heard a suspicious transmission when they were leaving Boss. Everybody stay in your seats. That's what he heard as a suspicious transmission, just to let you know. This is the last voice transmission from United 175. The controller's attention, however, is firmly fixed on the hijacked Flight 11. Center, where do you place him in relation to 583 now? He's off about 9 o'clock at about 20 miles. Looks like he's heading southbound, but there's no transponder, no nothing, and no one's talking to him. In Manhattan, the rush hour is reaching its peak. Over a million commuter cars are heading over the bridges and through the tunnels into an island just 13 miles long. If you see the enemy as strong, Remember the groups that had formed a coalition to fight the Prophet? They were 10,000. But remember how God gave victory to his faithful servants. Flight 11 is now heading south over Manhattan itself. The aircraft's airspeed has increased dramatically since the die. When the zero hour approaches, wholeheartedly welcome death for the sake of God, always be remembering God. Either end your life while praying seconds before the target, or make your last words, there is no God but God, Muhammad is his messenger. Afterwards, we will all meet in the highest heaven. Inshallah. What's happening? All of a sudden, she said, you know, what's going on, what's happening. I don't know if she was talking to Betty or if she was just verbalizing it. The airplane is all over the place. I asked her, can you look out the window? This was right near the end of our conversation. She said, I see water, I see, I see, we're flying low, we're flying way too low. I see buildings, I see lots of buildings. I see the water, I see the buildings. I see buildings. We're low. We're far too low. <laughs> so, what do we do now? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I guess it starts to... The crash of Flight 11 started a chain of events that still dominates today's world. In the convulsions that followed, the calm and resourceful actions of Flight 11's crew have not been recognized. But in a very real sense, it was they who began the fight back against a new and appalling terror. What my wife and Betty Ong and, and the rest of the crew did that day 
is is unbelievable. When, when they talk about heroes that day, there were also heroes in the air, and those heroes were, were flight attendants. I hope people realize that flight attendants are just not someone that throws a, a crappy meal in your lap, because it goes well, well beyond that. Dealing with the personal loss, I, I just don't even know how to describe that. Um, John and I were married for almost 18 years, and um, we have three children, a home, life together, and all of a sudden your world has just completely changed. You know, we're still lucky enough to be here and enjoy life, and if anything, want to reach out and grab it even more and try to take hold of that piece of it that John's never going to be entitled to have. You know, I don't feel that's fair for my wife. You know, and for all the people that day, you know, you're supposed to die old, you know, and be married. And for me, it was we were supposed to have a child, and um, in, in a heartbeat, things can change, and it did for me personally. And I know one day I will see her again, and that's the only comforting thing.